this presentation for everybody. Um, and anyone would like the link to this at the end, they just need to uh, connect with me or Ryan and we'll send that to you so you uh, uh, don't have to take meticulous notes and then we'll make the, uh, the video of this available. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen right now and get us moving. Um, so again, Gaudi Law is my firm, um, downtown Upland, and we work all over uh, Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County, Riverside, and then all over, all over um, California. But we've created um, what we think are the keys to understanding California probate sales for professionals and really for anybody logging in. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I wanted to focus on, Ryan, you touched on this, is probate is growing. I, I've done research and, and uh, the number of Americans age 65 and older will more than double in the next 40 years. I, again, I say double in the next 40 years. Um, the number of Americans retiring has nearly doubled since 2000 is now, now estimated at 10,000 people a day, which is just mind blowing. What it means is the population is aging. And because the population is aging, we are essentially in a, a place where there are going to be a lot of estates, a lot of um, opportunities to help folks and families who've lost a loved one, especially when it comes to selling uh, their real property. And it's, it is a process. And so um, if those of you that are sitting there going, wondering why would I want to know about probate sales, um, these are just some basic numbers that we're seeing that are that are staggering. Ryan, uh, uh, Tom, I'm sure you guys are seeing some of the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Absolutely. essentially, um, I think what, what it is from a standpoint of being, being an interested in knowing about probate sales, there's some keys. The first key is ascertaining who the legal owner of the probate property is, the estimated value, and whether there's equity. These seem like basic things, but ascertaining the legal owner is huge. And so one of the reasons we do these seminars with Tycor is because the first thing we need to do, first things first, pull title now. Um, and then Tom, I'd love for you to even jump in right now and talk about why it's important to pull title at the beginning of a process. Why is that something somebody who's an agent that may be watching should do immediately before they, they even sign the person up? as a client, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, sure, I, I definitely agree. I think how the record shows who the owner is is gonna be pretty important and impact how you're gonna con continue through this process. Um, you know, we see quite often that the person working with the agent is a, um, is a loved one of the deceased individual that um, uh, owns the property and, and they're trying to now um, market it and sell it and, and they don't really know how title is held or what steps they need to take and uh, or they believe title is held in a certain way and think they can go in a particular direction and um, when, we, when the title report comes out they find differently they find out differently and that does impact some of the questions that you may ask when you talk to sit across the desk from uh, from Jason um, and it also may impact the direction that you'll be able to go and, and time frames and whatnot so I think that's definitely a an important step in um, in this process is finding out how title is held. So it may it may also require you to do other steps, such as maybe it was a mom and dad that held title and one of them passed away sometime in the past, but nothing was done and there was a joint tenancy and now you need to clear up that joint tenancy and you'll have to request a death certificate. And I'm telling you with, it was already difficult to get the uh, death certificates from, uh, from uh, uh, some of the county reporters Yes. Uh, and now with COVID, it makes it even more difficult to get it. So that might be something you want to start the process on uh, or as early as possible or as soon as possible. Yeah, so on, that, on that slide right there, it talks about tenants in common. Um, we had a question that came up even this morning, Tom, right? That was yep. a question of, hey, um, they want to do this, but uh, can they do it as individual and the trust as joint tenants? Yeah, no. Unfortunately, only, only uh, natural per people, natural persons can hold title as joint tenants. Um, you can't hold joint tenants with something, an entity that, uh, in theory, cannot die. Yeah, you know, cannot die. So right, and and the issue, you know, that we, the, I think the 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 reality is what we're trying to say here is there are things that are going to show up on title that will change the direction that we go with a case, and and so making sure that I work with 
with Tom and, and Ryan and his team is huge at the beginning of this. Yes, it's a shameless plug, but it's so important to have these people and be able to talk to the underwriter himself about these issues and collaborate is, is beyond valuable. Um, and, and if so, I may add just another, another not just knowing how title is held, uh, but um, there could be things that are of record uh, that impact, that could impact the sale uh, of the property as well that you would want to know. Yeah, exactly. And so essentially we are now, if we've pulled title and we've determined that there is a deceased person on title, we're going to get to what what are called letters of administration in a minute and I'll have Tom jump back in. But for now, one of the things that we skip sometimes is we have to determine the value and the estimated equity. If there's negative, zero or, or insufficient equity, it's not a good case. And so uh, short sales rarely work in probates. And I know there are people maybe even watching this that would disagree with me, but from a standpoint as the, the attorney handling the case before a judge, the judge is gonna wanna know why did you bring a case before my court when there was negative equity? Was it just so that you could be paid and the realtor? And the answer is typically yes, because the heirs will end up with nothing. So those are something we typically stay away from. Well, how do you determine the value and the estimated equity? Uh, hopefully there's a realtor involved and we can get what's called the comparative market analysis um, and estimate what the value is gonna be. Um, one of the things we've seen a lot is trying to figure out what's owed on a reverse mortgage. Sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes the reverse mortgage company will not speak to you. And so therefore trying to get what are called special letters of administration so you can talk to them is important. And, and we don't want to start down the road and find out there's no equity. You know, 08, 09, 2010. Yes, a lot of probate work is recession proof because people pass away in good years and bad. But essentially the in those years, because the market dropped so much, a lot of people, a lot of properties that look like they had equity when we started ended up with nothing. So it's really important to figure that out. Um, key number two, understanding the typical probate sellers, which are typically your clients if you're going to be the agent. Um, the first thing, I used to have this at the end of this presentation, I have it at the beginning now, probate equals the death of a loved one. Don't forget that. There are way too many people we work with who are uh, uh, skipping the process of being human. Your client just lost somebody. Um, you know, remember that, mourn with them um, and, and make sure that they, um, that, they, that they feel that you care about them because I've seen people lose, uh, Ryan and I had a case where a realtor just wasn't following that and lost the sale. Um, so that's our sale and friendship. I mean, because they thought that it was originally a friendship, but people got greedy. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, the, and a lot of you are going, how do I get probate sales, which I'll talk about throughout this as an agent, they're going to be people, you know, mostly, they're going to be from people like me or people that you know, and so don't ruin a friendship to, to get a sale, you'll get the sale, but love the person as well. Um, and be honest, hey, I really want to sell the property, but boy, sorry for your loss and, and walk with them, especially if you've lost somebody close to you, you'll know how to do that. The second thing is that the, to understand that the sellers are typically the children and they're typically very motivated to sell. So that's something to keep in mind as well. We'll talk a little bit more about the sellers. Um, and what I mean by that is they're not, it's not their, their home. They're, they're going, mom and dad live there. We're going to clean it out. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And so um, it's, it's, it's an important thing to understand. Key number three, understanding the typical probate buyers. Okay. Now, the probate buyers are typically investors. A lot of our cases, I'd say, you know, of our 75 to 100 probate sales that we work with with different people a year, they're, they're I'd say 75% are bought by investors, okay? So um, great thing about investors, they can close quickly um, once the appropriate court documentation has been filed and the proper notices have been given. But ultimately, we, really like to work with investors. A lot of times it's all cash, no inspection, no contingency, um, but, but that's something to keep in mind. Investors will often offer to have you act as their agent as well as an agent. Am I allowed to double end a probate sale? My answer to that is typically yes, but you have to talk with your company, your broker to determine what the rules are, what you're allowed to do. And of course it has to be a fair deal to the family. So as long as there's full transparency with that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're fine with that. Tom, Ryan, any thoughts about that idea of double ending a sale? Well, I think the only comment that I would have is uh, 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 a, uh, 
uh, flip, quick flip. Yeah. Um, that would be the only concern that from a, from a tunnel insurance standpoint that we may want to take a closer look at if it's being purchased uh, and that, that $1 amount and sold the next day or, or uh, you know, a, a few, few days later for a substantially higher amount. Yeah. We may, want, we may have an issue there and may, may want to take a closer look and ask, and, and ask some, appro you know, some, some appropriate uh, um, uh, questions. So that would be the only concern that I would, I yeah. would have. That's great. We're actually going to talk a little bit about what the appropriate pricing and purchase value is for properties and probate and how that's determined. And working with you, I know that you've been the, been the stopgap with some people taking advantage of families. But we all want to make money here. We're just not trying to take advantage of families who already lost someone. Um, so moving on, key number four. Hang on one, hang on one second yeah, for me, Jason. Yeah, Ryan. Um, just as a, uh, as a reminder to everyone on the call, because there's quite a few people on, on the, the class here today, um, if you do have questions, down on the bottom part of the screen, you'll see the part where it says Q and A. Uh, feel free to go ahead and put um, Q and A's uh, questions in there, um, number one, and we'll get those answered. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, in an effort on this, this class here, there's, I think, 32 people on the call so far right now. Uh, I think some people are planning on watching it on Facebook. So, um, again, we're, we're moving with the cheese on this one here. Uh, there was a question that was in the chat window, uh, which asked, where do you get the letters of administration from? Do you get them from the attorney? I believe the answer is you get them from the courts requested by the attorney. Uh, yes. But uh, Jason, that's more of a question for you. Yeah, and we're, we're going to dig into to letters a little more. I actually have a copy of it, a picture of it we're going to talk about. But I see Dean's question there. And essentially, we get them for you from the court. And, and special letters are just meant for a short period of time. And they're, they're assigned to say, look, and people are going, what are letters? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but essentially it's the, the authority from the court to do something. Usually we want um, full authority with letters, but we'll talk about the difference between that, but special letters so that you can determine whether there's value or what a reverse mortgage value is. That's something that we get from the court. So, um, so yeah, that, that's a great question. Please keep the questions coming. We, we have a full Q and A at the end too, for anybody that wants to, but feel, feel free to have them come right through. So Key number four, okay, and and what are the chances? Key number four would be understanding what probate letters and notice of proposed actions are and why a probate real estate sale cannot close without these important court documents. I'm so happy to have the title guys on with us today who can really dig into this. But what are letters? Well, this is what they look like. It's a, a blurry picture. I, I searched high and low trying to find a non-blurry picture, but this is what we call a judicial counsel form, very standard legal documents that we use to file things. And this is what letters look like. Now, what we'd want is we'd want the court to have approved this down here at the bottom left uh, as um, a, appointing someone as the administrator if there's not a will or the executor if there is a will. But escrow cannot close until the letters have been issued by the court and certified we're recording. And so why do we need those letters to sell the family home? This was mom and dad's home. The great Tom Bernath, who I look at as the judge <laughs> in many of these things, is here. Tom, why do we need letters of administration, this piece of paper right here to the right, to sell property from a probate? It's the key to the whole thing. It's the, it's the key of keys. Tom, what, what, tell well, us from, what we need to know. Yeah, I mean, from a title standpoint, that's that shows who is authorized to act on behalf of the estate and what their authority is uh, to act on behalf of the estate and how what additional requirements we're going to be asking for um, to move forward and ensure a sale out of the estate um, that is uh, uh, being handled by the why administrator can't, executive. Why can't the kid, if my mom dies, why can't I just hire my, my realtor, my agent and sell the property? Why do I have to go to the court? What if it's my wife that died? Why can't I just sell the property that's just in her name? What, why would well, I you know? That would be nice if you could, yeah. but otherwise there was no way for anybody to know that you were authorized to act on behalf of the estate without getting these letters issued. So that's right. what, that's the, that, that's the document that will show that a, an individual has the authority uh, appointed by the court um, uh, it, to act on behalf of the estate. Otherwise, you know, you could have anybody claim and uh, come up and say that I'm the executor or the administrator 
uh, of my dad's or mom, well, my dad or mom's estate, and I'm going to head, I'm going to go ahead and sell this property. Right. And without that, you don't know what other requirements there are for them to to um, conduct that sale yep. and to move forward. Right. So it, that le- those documents are very important, and the need to have a certified copy to record yes. is because that's what establishes the authority of record uh, for anybody looking at the title from that point forward to show that yes, there was. On uh, you know a probate on the deceased individual that that was uh, the record title holder, um, and that there was somebody appointed to act on behalf of that estate. So that has to be recorded. It's almost as if it uh, you know look at it almost the same way as a as certain power of attorneys where uh, the power of attorney needs to be of record in that county to establish authority. So I just um, want to come back and revisit that real quick. Just reemphasize on that one. It should be the original. Uh, copy from the courts because Tom, it needs to be recorded, right? Well, it's a certified copy of the of that document. Now, you know, and I understand, and and uh, and I'm dealing with this, and I was gonna, I wasn't gonna bring this up now, but I guess I will because it's probably a good time to do it because of, of the need for a certified copy. But we understand now because of the COVID situation and the impact it has on the courts that it may be difficult to get copies of documents. And, and, and I would venture to guess that, you're, that Jason, you probably have maybe a couple of copies on hand just in case it's requested, but I'm dealing with this all the time. Yes. With certain orders and, and letters and things that you need to put of record um, that needs to be certified because the county recorder will not accept a, a copy of a document from the courts to record. It must be yes. a certified, uh, it must be certified. Yeah, two things. Oh. Thank you. That Tom, bringing that up now is perfectly timed, actually. Let me just jump in for a second. Mm-hmm. If you look at the letters that I have on the screen, the bottom right-hand side is where it is certified. And so the reason that's, that's important is because a signed copy like this, and letters, for those of you watching, is similar to an order from the court, okay? This is ordering that this person, let's just say it's, you know, Jason Gowdy has authority to deal with the estate of his parents. But that could be stale. It could be old. The certification tells you that it's recent. And so that's why the recorder wants to see it was within the last at least 60 days. Because if the authority has lapsed from the court, they won't certify it. Okay. Now, what we do, practical advice for those of you involved in real estate sales, whether we're the attorney or Tycor is doing title or not, which we hope we are, we like to make it easy. When we get letters from the court, we order two, count them, two certified copies from the court, it's a little bit more expensive. You're gonna spend 20 to 25 to hundred dollars getting those pieces of paper, but then they're in the file so that if something that never happens, like every single court in the world closes down for three months, which we, of course we've seen that happen, then you have them. And so we haven't had the same problem that you're running into, I'm sure, Tom and Ryan, which is that people don't have those certified copies and they can't get them right now. And, yep. and Lord knows how backed up the courts are gonna be when this opens back up. So, which is hope we're hoping it was going to be in a couple of weeks. But I think that's for us just a prudent step is to get certified copies. We always get two because some banks need to see them as well. And then they're in the file. And we, what we do is we connect with the escrow company directly and say, we have them. Can we drive them or FedEx them to your office so you have them? So that they're not, so, so that's a step that can take months if the courts are closed, but even a few weeks if the courts are open, if the attorney hasn't taken the step to get those. So. Mm-hmm. So some question you could be asking who you're working with, but yeah, I could tell you right now, I just ordered some stuff from the Orange County courts, 30 days minimum to yep. get something from the, uh, uh, a certified copy of a document from the Orange County court. And, and I, you know, and with LA County closing till the end of July, being on lockdown till the end of July, that's probably going to be even longer in LA County. So. Right. Right. And it's, we, you know, we, we, I mean, I feel for the courts and a lot of, there's some, there's some innovation coming where we can do some filings online, where we can do some things without hearings. I think there'll be some good things that come from this in the end, but uh, being, being prepared is important. The next thing about letters is do we do full or limited authority? Um, And that's, that's huge. It looks like my, some reason my screen just left. Hang on one second, guys. It's going to come back. I promise. And shit, now we cancel. Present, ba-boom, sorry about that. So we are essentially able to determine whether we do full or limited authority by whether you wanna have to go back to the court to get permission to sell the real property. Uh, With full authority, we don't have to do that. We just give what is called notice of proposed action, which I'm gonna show everyone on the next slide. 
Um, with limited authority, we have to go back and do what's called a report of sale that pub is published in a newspaper. And some of you have been involved in this, have been in court when there's an auction happening. And that's because there was a report of sale happening and people can come and bid. Um, we, we have, again, about 70 to 100 probates going at any time, and 100% of them are full authority. In order to get someone bonded by the court or get them full authority, they have to be bonded uh, by an insurance company, by a surety. And in order to do that, sometimes an office has to co-sign with them and our office is able to do that. Not every firm does that. So we really like to stay away from limited authority. If we take over a case from another firm, which we don't love to do, but we do sometimes, uh, we'll immediately convert it to, uh, to full authority. And it just makes things way easier. So it's more like telling the court what you did rather than asking for permission, and especially in the world where the courts are slow, uh, it's the only way to really go. Mm -hmm. um, so the question becomes also bond or no bond. Well, that's tied to whether it's full or limited authority. Now, sometimes when it's full authority, we can get the bond waived. What's a bond? It's like an insurance policy. But the court wants to make sure not just that the heirs are protected, but that the creditors of the estate are protected. We're going to talk later on about the, the stages of a probate, but the main reason probate exists is to make sure before those kids get their money that creditors get paid first. Um, and so getting bonded, a lot of wills will say waive bond for the executor and courts ignore that routinely because they want to make sure that the person being appointed does what they're supposed to do. And if not, there's an insurance policy to pay off the creditors and the heirs. Um, the next document. So again, the letters is the main document that we uh, are, are looking for to close escrow. The other document is what's called a notice of proposed action or, or a waiver of notice of proposed action. Again, uh, despite my best efforts, a blurry picture of it on the right. But again, what this document would say is it would show all the details of the sale, the sale price, the realtor commissions, all of that, and it would be sent to all the heirs. And as long as 14, 15 days have passed, then we can close escrow after that. If all the family is in agreement, well, then we can go ahead and close escrow with what's called a waiver of notice of proposed action. But this document is just as important as this letters of administration. Uh, Tom, you know, again, could you speak to, to why this is such an important document um, in terms of making sure that people that, that you know, are supposed to get noticed got it? And why, why is it a requirement for title? Well, I mean, I think you hit it right on nose. Escrow cannot close until this notice for post action has been, has been done. Um, and we will once we're no, once we know we're involved in a uh, in a uh, sale where a probate is part of the uh, the process, we will look at the case and get some information on our own, especially the list of those required to get notice. Um, so that way, when the notice of proposed action uh, is provided to us, we can compare it and see that the notice has been sent to all parties that are entitled to receive notice. Um, now, there is a 15-day period that you need to give the heirs to have an opportunity to object to, um, they can object or consent on the same document, um, and uh, so you give them 15 days. Now, oddly enough, I've seen um, some notice or opposed actions where the heirs were given more than 15 days. Um, I don't know why, but we've seen a couple of them, and uh, if that's the time frame that you're giving the heirs, you have to stick to that time frame. You can't say, oh, well, it's supposed to only be 15 days. Well, if you've given them more than 15 days, you have to give them the time frame that you've given. Um, so we do require that or a waiver or copies of the waivers of the notice uh, from all the heirs. I can tell you that working with Jason's group, um, you know, we do have uh, a little bit of flexibility because of our relationship with him, asking him certain questions that may allow us to, um, um, uh, you know, I mean, this notice of proposed action is something you can't circumvent. It's statutory, you know, statutory required, so you can't not do it. But um, uh, we will take some representations from his group, such as um, at the expiration of that 15 days, whoever is responsible for getting the objections or consents back, um, there's always somebody uh, that's typically, um, I believe, Jason's group. Jason, you correct me if I'm wrong. Um, then we will need at the end of that 15 days a statement from whoever is getting these notices back that uh, no objections have been made. Um, yeah, and so, absolutely. And part of it is sometimes, the, you know, the, uh, there'll be a requirement that we give a letter to that effect. And so, mm -hmm. but really it's, it's, a, it's an orderly process by which we are going to the court to get, get authorized 
We've given notice to all the family. Hopefully by then all the family's in agreement. We all know that doesn't always happen. And then if not, we've said, hey, the property is gonna sell. Here's what it's gonna sell for. Speak now or forever hold your peace. And so the, uh, very rarely, very rarely, it does happen, but very rarely does anyone object. But if they do, the second page of this document, they can object and um, essentially stop the process and force us to do what's called a report of sale. We're doing that right now. Uh, actually on a case where I still can't believe we're doing it, but one of the siblings lives in the house and doesn't, doesn't want to sell. So uh, again, if you're watching, the key documents you're going to need to close escrow are these letters of administration, preferably with full authority, or this notice, I'm sorry, and this notice of proposed action or what's called a waiver of a notice of proposed action where everybody just says, I, I don't care about this, this, so go ahead and do it. Jason, can I ask a quick question on this notice, if you don't mind, just from a just personal knowledge while I have you here, and it may help those on, the, on this, uh, on this uh, webinar as well. What if you have an heir that has just verbally expressed through the process of uh, after the father passed away or mother passed away, um, has verbally expressed that um, is his belief or her belief that the property could be sold for more if we spent some time fixing it up? Um, but, uh, but it goes on deaf ears. The administrator have, is another, another sibling, um, and does a notice proposed action, sends it out to everybody, including this particular uh, individual that has verbally expressed that they believe they can sell it for more if they fixed it up, gets the notice, but does nothing, doesn't respond within that time frame. Would you be concerned with what they verbally expressed before, or is this not, notice? Absolutely not. They had. That's why this process exists, so that somebody cannot come back and say, "I didn't know." They they were given this notice. The the verbal um, would never even. Let's say the opposite is true. They said, "No problem, sell it," and then they objected. The written objection would would be what you'd have to go on. Um, okay. So I would not be worried about it at all because they've waived. As long as notice was given properly, they waived the right to come back later and say anything. And that's why, again, probate, I always tell people, it takes a long time, but it does make sense. Especially if you're somebody who is an heir or a creditor, you, you're going to get taken care of and, and paid. It's going to take a while, but absent somebody doing a living trust or something like that, that we'll talk about it again to avoid probate, it's the process we live in. Um, now, let me ask in regards yeah. to this, Jason, before you move yeah. forward, yeah. a couple of things. This is um, when it's waived when by all heirs or beneficiaries. That's assuming that people are getting along. Uh, what if they're not getting along? So if they're not getting along, a lot of times what will have happened is they'll object to the, you know, there's Sally and Johnny and Sally hires us to be the administrator. We file a petition with the court and they object and they get an attorney. And a lot of times we'll work something out where they do it together or something like that. But if they object to one of these, the notice of proposed action, the only thing we can do is file what's called a report of sale. And as long as the court approves the sale that day, it's set for a hearing, um, there's nothing that person can do. Um, and so there's also a process where we value the property by what's called a probate referee, um, kind of an odd, odd term, but that's what we call them, the probate appointed appraiser, to make sure it's not being sold for, for some kind of undervalue. Um, and we'll talk about kind of how that works uh, in a minute as well. So that, that's those parts there. I, I guess one of the questions, I want to remind that we're talking to predominantly uh, realtors on here. Yeah. Um, at what point of this deal do the realtors get involved? Like when, when do they come across this? When, when do they get you involved? When do they get involved in this one? How do we, um, how do we cross the dots on this one or connect the dots? Yeah. So essentially what, what um, they're going to be involved from the beginning. So if we sort of go back, you know, the, the first key is, you know, they, when they've come to us is they've, they've already made contact with the client. Okay. So they're ascertaining who the legal owner of the property is. They're pulling title, they're determining the value. And once that's decided, we're filing for probate. Okay. And so we're, you know, again, I'm telling them who the seller is. Um, we're understanding who the buyers are. And then the question becomes, um, when do we, and how do we list the property, which we're going to talk about in a second as well. Um, and so by this point, they've already been, uh, uh, they've already been engaged and they're basically waiting for us to get them the legal authority. But the question becomes, you know, uh, when can they list, which I'm actually going to talk about in a minute. So, um, you know, let me, I'll skip ahead to the next key here, which is understanding which type of mm -hmm. to file. Well, which, but, but, 
But that's a good question, Ryan, because I know that I've probably referred a few uh, <laughs> to Jason where we've had somebody call and say that I'm the only, I'm the only kid. Here's my mom and my mom and my mom's will. I want to sell the house. Why can't I do that? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, so there may be times when, you know, the, they may talk to you and you say, well, we can do all this stuff and file your petition, but you'll also need to get plugged into an agent. So right. but we do, we do, we do see that quite often where they think a will is sufficient and that's all you need because it's right, like they're going to walk that, up and hand it to someone and they're going to go, okay, <laughs> let's sell the property. Yeah. Right. Right. So even if there is a will, we're still going through probate, even if right. there's a will. Yeah. So, and that's one of the things when we look at, you know, the, the next key, which is understanding which type of probate to file. The first thing we talk about is our real property. Is the gross estate worth more than 162,000? And then did they leave a will or did they do a trust? Now, if they did a trust and it was properly funded, which we'll talk about later, we don't have to go through probate. They don't have to pay us. They don't have to wait. They can just list and sell the property. And in the market we're in with COVID, there's nothing more important than avoiding this process. Um, the, the value of the 162,500 is what's called the small estate value or referred to as that. And essentially any real property is going to have to go get a court order so that Tom and his team, Ryan and his team will ensure title. Um, but if it's worth less than 162,000, there's, there's a shorter process we can go through. So that's one of the first things. Um, and again, that's the gross, not the net. Okay. So once we've determined that, now we're talking about understanding when a probate property can be listed. Now, this is a tricky thing. There are a lot of people that would say, don't, I'm going to back up here, don't do it until the letters have been issued. I'm going to push back on that and suggest that it can be listed whenever the family and the property are, quote, ready. Okay, so let's talk about what that looks like. So now the property may need to be cleaned out. A lot of times somebody's lived there for many years. And if they've lived there for many years, there's stuff there. Um, one of the questions people ask is, what about estate sales? I can tell you I'm not a huge fan of estate sales unless you go with the right people. There's a lot of unscrupulous people in that industry that are stealing stuff and doing crazy things as, as part of that process. And so we've got a couple of people that we can, can uh, you know, connect you with that are, uh, you know, able to help with that. But a lot of times it's just the family going through the, the things. Um, and then, you know, the Tom talked about, well, let's fix the house up. Very often the agents I've worked with, and a lot of them are logged on here, are um, uh, or are going to be listening live later, they know how to tell the people what to do. They know better than to tell the people to spend a ton of money on the property that that's going to turn into anything. And I let them be the experts on that. Um, so again, do we need the letters to, issue to, 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 to be issued? Not really. Um, the questions I have are, are all the heirs and beneficiaries in agreement about who will the administrator or the executor be? If the executors, there's a will, administrator, if there's not. If they're all in agreement, then check with your broker about listing prior to letters being issued. And if they're good, then go for it. A lot of times we're already in escrow waiting for the court authority. So the sale is contingent upon the person being appointed. But number three here is the most important. Are all the heirs and beneficiaries in agreement about who the administrator will be? If they're not, then hiring agents to sell property based on you being appointed is, is, is a waste of time because what if the other kid comes in and they're appointed and not you? Now them and their agent will be, will be appointed. So we almost never do this unless all of the kids are in agreement. Um, and so we really need to make sure that that's the case. But for those of you who are questioning about when we have time to do that, you can email or call us directly uh, after this and we can chat about that a little bit more. Um, and so um, essentially the next key, we've got a few more, few more keys and then we'll jump into some Q&A, but understanding the rules about appropriate pricing and court valuation of the probate property. This is huge. And it's something that I've run into with Tom and, and Ryan many times, but essentially probate sale, pricing and control uh, court scrutiny, investors beware. There may be investors that end up watching this. Um, very often when somebody is appointed, every investor in the world sends them an offer or calls them and tells them, you don't need to list it, I'll give you this offer. And some of them come to us going, this is a screaming deal. Um, and what we tell them is the court typically wants to see what, what they refer to as full market saturation, and that would be listing it on the MLS um, is typically the way that's done. Now you can sell to an investor without uh, listing it on the MLS, but the court will, be, will appoint what's called a probate referee an independent appraiser to ensure the sale price was fair. How do they do that? They do that by doing 
what's called a comparative market analysis, which all of you have heard of. They're not doing more than that. They very rarely even visit the property. And then they're going to compare the sale price to that value and make sure it's not that far off. Well, if it is, yeah. they're going to want to know why. They're going to want to know why the difference in value was there. And so sometimes you're, you know, those, those agents that have worked with us will be able to tell you um, that, that you can say, hey, here's why. There was, a, you know, there was a, a rotting, you know, floorboard. There was, there was something that needed to be fixed that brought the value down. So uh, many times we have, we have had to part ways with investors who've tried to use us to help them take advantage of families. Um, and so remember, court, the court process is there to protect everybody, but especially the unsophisticated clients, a lot of which have never been through this before. And so we want to make sure that the vultures are circling, that we don't have the wrong people buying the property for the, for the for for way less than it's worth. So um, huge, huge thing to keep in mind. Um, key number eight, a couple more to go. Understanding what happens to the proceeds immediately after the probate sale and why that matters at the first meeting. So some of you are going to be hired, and it's not like a traditional sale where when I sell my property, I get the proceeds immediately. That's not what happens. The proceeds go into an estate account and sit there until the probate's over, sometimes a year after that. There are times we do what are called preliminary distributions, but a lot of times it's a shock for them to find out after escrow that they're not getting money right away. So I always encourage the agents to tell them that. We always tell them that, hey, this is not coming right away and make sure you've told your siblings the same thing. Um, the, uh, uh, the proceeds must stay in the account. And now, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about probate loans and advances, okay? Essentially, probate loans are companies that will come in and offer you a 30% fee to get paid now. Now, we can't stop people from doing that, but there should be a way for you to get a preliminary distribution from the estate some level without having to do that. We strongly recommend against it. We do, however, have a friend of ours, Paul, who does do uh, pretty reasonable loans and we can connect you with him. If, uh, oh, by the way, um, he is on the call here today with us. I can bring him in. Um, yes, yeah, let's, uh, I don't know if he can come in right now and, and speak to us a little bit about, I, I emailed Paul in the last two days uh, with folks that are needing money to be able to do some of this. Um, and even if he jumps Paul, I'm pulling you across, so you should be popping up here in a second if uh, you're not already available. Um, Open it's still right there. It was just showing. All right, well, I'll, fi I'll find him and get him in, and then when oh, he comes in, jump in, we'll jump in at the end. I, I see him popping up now. If he's uh, Paul, are you uh, give him a second to get his uh, microphone working if possible? Um, but again, Paul Paul's able to come in and for a reasonable rate help people get through the process, the period of time when they're not going to be able to get their inheritance, but they need it. Some of them are living in the house and need right. to move so it can be sold. And, and Paul's been able to help some of our clients do that. So, um, Paul, can, can you hear us, Paul? I I'm gonna keep, him, keep so. moving us along. If Paul jumps in, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll back up to this and have him, have him uh, tell us what he can do for everybody. A um, couple more keys, understanding number nine, how to, under, how to deal with squatters, which are usually tenants and family and other occupying, others occupying estate property and how eviction works in a probate setting. This is really simple for me. Always try to work things out without going through eviction. Always, always, always. You think the probate process is slow, try the eviction process, especially right now with the COVID restrictions on evictions. Um, there are really no easy ways to evict a tenant in California right now. There really never have been. It's a very tenant-friendly state. If you're a landlord, you don't like that. If you're a tenant, you are, you do. Um, but ev eviction can take years. So what we've typically done is reminded the person living in the house, which is usually a child and an heir, that they are going to be having their share deducted every month they live there for their, fair, their percentage of the fair market value of the rent. They're not living there for free. Now, once you tell them that, their mindset typically changes and they realize that they're not holding things up. It's costing them money to live there. Um, so what we typically do at that point is we start treating them like a human and say, look, we know you need to get somewhere and, and then we can bring someone like Paul in to do a short-term loan. Or if there's money to do a distribution, we can do that and get them moved along. Uh, but evict only when necessary, but give the legal notice to them to start the timeframes while, 
while you're evicting. Tom, I'm sure you've seen situations like this. Any, any comments at all? Well, no, but that is a big issue on uh, probate sales as a, as a party uh, that may be occupying the uh, premises. So that could impact, uh, you know, how, how we insure and what, what exception we may want to show in the policy as to rights of parties in possession, right. especially if it's, uh, if it's uh, an heir that believes that, uh, uh, you know, they're entitled to possess or, you know, occupy and possess. We don't know what their thought process is. Right. Um, and uh, and they, they don't move out and the new buyer wants to take possession and, and occupy the premises. And that could become a concern for us under our policy. So uh, the, who is in possession and what their intent is as far after escrow closes is a big issue for us. So that is a question that we do ask um, who is who is currently occupying the property on a probate sale. That's, yeah, that's great. And that's why, again, I like to work with Tom because Tom and Ryan and their team dig into the weeds at the beginning so we don't have to find out that, there, that there's, you know, impasses at the end. Also, I would just say those of you that are participating that have questions, that'd be a great time to start uh, typing them out. So we have them, if you have any, at the end, um, we're going to, a couple more keys and then we're going to jump into Q&A and then hopefully Paul can jump in by then. Um, key number 10, understanding how to deal with a pending foreclosure or trustee sale date in a probate real estate sale. Now this is, boy, this is a, this is a tough day to be in. You're, you're dealing with the death of a loved one and their house is about to be sold at auction. Um, so what do we need to know in those situations? Uh, first of all, when there's a notice of default and uh, uh, Tom, tell us what a notice of default is. What, what, what is, when somebody gets a notice of default related to their mortgage, what is that? Well, that's a, a notice from the lender that the borrower typically is three months behind on their payments, and the uh, and the lender has initiated the process to foreclose on the property, and that's step one in uh, in the foreclosure process is uh, is uh, is recording and posting and and serving and mailing uh, the notice of default. Oh, and so that's the beginning of the of the hey things are about to get bad, and a lot of times the the, the, the kids didn't know that. Maybe it was already in default before mom died. Maybe it got in, went into default after she died and they just didn't get the mail or whatever. But ultimately, it's an important thing to know. If, 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 we're, if we're about to sell a property or list a property and it's a notice of default, what our firm does is we send a, I'll go back to my slide, we send a, a letter to the foreclosure company. Typically, it's been assigned to a different company by then or the bank that's holding the mortgage and tell them, hey, we filed for probate. Here's the listing agreement. The property is going to be listed or we're in escrow. Cool your jets. Uh, they don't want to spend money on legal fees. So if, they, if we can sell the property for them and get them paid, they're not going to go through the trouble of instituting legal proceedings. So um, immediately that's what we, what we try to find out. And there's three months on a notice of default. So you don't want to wait till the, till, till the third month to deal with the notice of default. So you, right. if, you get a, if there's a notice of default recorded, um, you want to talk to Jason and his group immediately because you don't have an unlimited amount of time when a notice of default is reported. Well, let me ask another a third part of the question, which is having to do with um, reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgage lender gets notified that, uh, that the owner is now deceased and they can initiate uh, pretty quickly, can't they? It doesn't have to be defaulted for three months in that case. Right. We, the reverse mortgage lenders are typically, you know, we kind of look at it like there's a six month window. It's a little more complicated than that. But typically reverse mortgages are not going to be as quick to do notice of default and, and set trustee sale dates by, by law and by typically their contracts. Um, they realize that the person who passed away, um, there needs to be an estate set up. Very often those, those uh, properties are not in a trust. So someone has to go to court to be appointed. So essentially, same kind of deal. We're trying to get them to wait. I have seen where somebody ignored the, the, the reverse mortgage company for too mm -hmm. long and they did file notice of default and they did set a trustee sale date. So they're not going to wait forever. They're not going right. to wait. Right. And some of the reverse mortgages are HUD back, so they can do a federal foreclosure process, which is a lot quicker than, a not than the state uh, under 2924, civil code 2924 yeah. foreclosure process. They I've only seen that happen once but they can do a federal foreclosure process on it um, on reverse mortgage. But I have seen lenders give six months, even a little longer to get the house sold after the, uh, after the death of the borrowers. Right? Yeah. And again, my experience is that they're typically able to, um, they're typically able to, um, 
you know, wait. They're, they're not in a hurry because they don't want to spend a bunch of money, um, you know, going through a process of, of uh, you know, foreclosing on someone if we're already doing the job for them, okay? The second situation is, is where- Yeah, one more second, uh, just to, I believe Paul, uh, he was trying to call in, so I, Paul, can you hear us? Yes, I, I can hear you. Hopefully hey, you can hear Paul, me. what's up, man? Hello. Hey, uh, d do me a huge favor. Hang on for me like a minute. Let me finish this little topic. No and problem. I'll bring you back in if that's okay. But so essentially sure. the second situation when there's a foreclosure is there's a trustee sale date set. Now, if there's an actual set, set, it's possible to stop it by filing a restraining order injunction as long as there's enough time. But even getting in court on an emergency basis right now is extremely difficult and it was before. So... A lot of times if there's a trustee sale date, the trustees will voluntarily stop sales if we threaten to go to court to stop them. Um, and then, but essentially uh, uh, the, the foreclosure process right now is kind of in, in, in limbo in flux, sort of frozen-ish because of COVID. So, but we still like to connect with the trustee and they're kind of, they're, if we get within seven days of that trustee sale date, they usually won't voluntarily change it. And again, that's when, for those of you asking, what does that mean? Well, the, the mortgage wasn't paid. We sent the notice of default. Now we're going to sell the property at auction. And so uh, typically those go for a lot lower than they would go on the open market. So that's kind of what you need to know about, about foreclosure. Now, um, we have Paul, Paul Wilkins, the great Paul Wilkins, um, who is, uh, you know, the, the, the guy that can really help families out that are looking to, um, trying to find the, uh, the slide I was looking for, but I'll just talk to Paul. Essentially, Paul, tell us what you can do for for families who are needing to get some funds, but the probate process is taking a long time. They know they're going to get some money. They might need to pay an attorney. They might need to move. How can you help them, and how does that work? And, and tell us a bit about that. Sure. Thanks, uh, Jason. Um, there's a couple of ways we can help out. We can provide funds directly to the administrator for estate purposes, such as uh, paying any loans on the property, paying HOA, delinquent property taxes. I've seen some properties, you know, going to sale because the estates were illiquid and didn't have the funds to, to reinstate the taxes. Also, if you have a particular family member or members that are living in the house and you need them to move, we can help those individuals. We can provide funds to individual heirs rather than the money being held against the estate. The heirs can borrow essentially against their own share. So as a key piece in the family, if, if Joe's been the deadbeat for, you know, all these years, let him give him some money, let him move out. You know, the estate can sell the property and take care of business. Uh, we can also provide money for property repairs, attorney fees, just about anything you can think of. Yeah, you know, I've seen, I've been doing this almost 24 years now, and I've seen just about everything you can imagine, plus a few more. Paul, well, what's, uh, what's the name of your company? Approved Inheritance Cash. Okay. And, and again, Pasadena. I, I want to put a plug in for Paul. There's many companies that do this, and, and at the very busy probate firm, um, Paul is one of only two people I would ever even talk to about this, let alone mention their name on, on something like this. Um, you know, there, there are uh, uh, certainly costs involved in these types of loans, um, higher than traditional loans, but they're helping people out in a, in a very tough time. And there are, there are sharks out there, you know, doing it twice, three times as much as what Paul and his team do. And they've just been, for me, like they have a heart for people. They want to make money like the rest of us, but I just, I want a big, big plug. Paul, is there a way... Uh, maybe Ryan and I can do it just to put the link to your business in the Q and A so we can make sure that people can get a hold of it. He put the information in the, uh, in the, in the notes or the comments section. So I copied it and pushed it back out just now to all panelists and attendees. Fantastic. The company Fantastic. And, uh, Fantastic. And, and Jason, before oh, we jump you. off, before we jump off this, uh, this topic, uh, Paul had mentioned that uh, if you have the occupant, which happens to be one of the deadbeat heirs and just want to get rid of him. So you offer him some money to move out and go away. What, from a, 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 a administrative process, would you need to ensure that you still get his consent, or what would you get as far as, I mean, if you give him money and he splits and you can't find him because he went to Vegas to put it all on, uh, you know, double zeros, um, and now you're trying to sell the property, and, and what, what kind of bus saw do you run into if you need to get him to sign something, or what would you do to get him to sign something before he 
before you gave them the money? Good question. Thank you. We secure our position by getting an assignment of interest in the estate. Essentially, this document signed, notarized, gets sent into the court, and it secures our position. So, in in many cases, this, these people disappear once they've moved out of the property, never to be seen again. Not a problem. We have filed that with the court. The court recognizes the efficacy of our assignment, and we get paid. So, you know, if he has good luck in Vegas, great, but that's not my concern. So it you would... require the administrator getting involved either. This is solely between the individual heir and our company. So you don't need extra court approvals or whatever. It's very streamlined and very quick. And quick. I was going to say, within it's, days. It's, it's very quick, and which is when people need it, you know, especially in the world we live in. Um, you know, there mm-hmm. are... There are a million scenarios we could go through where people need this, but it's, again, it's a meeting a need at a point when other lenders couldn't do this at all. So it's, it's a, you know, Paul's uniquely set up for that. So. Well, and just to be clear, the way, do you get a waiver of notice or does Paul's organization uh, step in and sign whatever that heir needs to sign? Because yeah, they're just, they're just, look, anyone can assign their interest in an estate to anyone else. And it's, it, there's an assignment of interest that's signed, typically filed with the court, and so therefore, if, some, if let's just say they assigned their entire interest to Paul in exchange for a lesser amount early, he would be paid from the distributive share as opposed to them. That's typically what would happen. And because the court's process, remember I told you probate is really about creditors being paid and especially those who have had their interest assigned. So Paul's gonna do his homework and make sure that there's actual equity and that there's, there's value in the estate. He's you know, gonna have to rely on, on us for that on some level. And there's, you know, so, but yeah, that's, they're signing that assignment is, is really all you need. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then Paul, I, I think hopefully you can stay on the line a bit, you know, when we get to the Q and A, but I'm sure I'm almost, almost there and I'll, I'll move us to that part because the last key, and I was so sad. I had to go to 11 keys. I had 10 keys, 11, 10 sounds so much better, but I think the first ones you did, you had seven, you keep adding I keys. Seven. <laughs> There are I'm starting more to feel like a janitor now. walking up and in the halls at a school with a big old gear ring, you it's see? It's hooked on. I got them, yeah. The understanding, the entire probate process is different phases and how the sale of real property fits in. It's not just about the sale. Now, those of you that are doing the real estate sale, you don't really participate in most of the probate. You participate in the first 25% of the timeline. Um, but what I feel like is important is if you can understand the whole process. I'm not going to go through that in detail right now, but what I've created here are three different stages. You know, there's no magic to this. This is how we explain it to people, but it goes through what happens in these first stages, the first 60 to 90 days, um, which is typically when the first hearing is. The next four to six months is when the real property is sold. And and that's kind of when your participation as an agent, real estate professional comes and goes. But then what happens after that? Well, then we final report and final hearing. And so those of you that have a question at all about what happens, I've just created a few slides for you um, to take a look at. If you have any questions, I actually have a video I created that kind of walks through this, but this sort of gives you the, the how, how everything works part in case anybody's asking. Um, but again, I don't think you need to get into that with your, your client. It's just something to be aware of. Um, as, we, as we finish the, the main kind of talk here, um, what, is, what is the effect of COVID-19? Um, essentially, the primary effect is that um, the probate process is the closing of the courts, extending most cases by three to six months on average. Um, that's typically what we're seeing. It could get worse. It could get better. Like I said, there are some things happening that are innovative where courts are going online, uh, virtual, electronic filings, uh, non-hearing procedures, things like that. There's, you know, it's America. We have the constitution. We're entitled to notice. So it's a little sticky on how to go to video for everything, but they're working on that. But again, essentially a three to six month extension is what we're looking at. Um, once the courts open back up, most of them are opening back up in some capacity here in the next couple of weeks, we'll know a little bit more. Um, but essentially, and then, so essentially that's what you need to know. Um, before I move off of that though, Tom, uh, Ryan, anything in terms of the effects of COVID more than the delays that you're seeing from a title standpoint? Well, I think just as, uh, as you guys are, are wrapping some of these things up too, and we're going to go into Q&A as we hit 1230. Uh, I'm promoting most of our attendees here to uh, panelists as well uh, along the way. So if people have questions, they can kind of ask the questions and we can have the feedback. 
uh, as well. So as you guys get promoted on that one, um, have the opportunity to jump in and be a part of it as well. Because obviously we want to make sure that this is as interactive as possible, that we're real people uh, that comes through on it. Um, so Jason, once we're done with your, your presentation, we'll go back into the gallery view so we can kind of get an idea. Perfect. Yeah, and I'm done done here in, in a second. Well, so. I, I'd like to add a few comments about, uh, you know, the with with COVID-19 um, and how, it's, how we're seeing the impact it has on closing real estate transactions. Uh, because they can't get certified copies of certain documents or even file petitions for things, um, unless it's a, uh, an extreme emergency, the courts aren't taking them. Um, and so from, from my standpoint, being an underwriter, I, I'm willing to, to figure out a way to still possibly move forward and close a deal. Um, we've got a transaction in Los Angeles County where it involves property that should have been transferred into a family trust, but was not. Um, and now, um, and, and unfortunately, that's just a, the, that ownership, there are five, there are four indivi five individuals owning this piece of property, all uh, a, a quarter interest, and, um, and uh, all of them are alive except for the one that should have transferred the property into their family trust, created the trust, everything, but recorded, uh, 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 had the deed drafted, signed it, but didn't get notarized, and it never got recorded. Um, and now they're trying to do the Hegstead petition, but of course the courts are delayed and they can't get it done and they have a, a it's all cash, hot buyer ready to close. Um, and uh, we found a way to uh, move forward on that deal based on the fact pattern, talking to the attorney and getting a level of comfort um, and some commitments um, uh, with the parties, uh, with the sellers, um, we were able to take some an identify an identified risk indemnity and and other things that would that allowed us to uh, move forward and 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 have that deal close on time. So we understand that this COVID is impacting the ability to close transactions, and we're looking at ways to still allow for that. But keep in mind that there will be things that will be needed. Um, it's like the indemnity and maybe, um, you know, hold money, depending on what the fact pattern is, we'll have to come up with our requirements. And if everybody's willing to do that, and the facts are such, we can move forward and close. So um, just wanted to throw that out there because it is, the COVID-19 is impacting um, getting things from the court, so. Okay, uh, last, last thing here is essentially, probate sounds like something we should avoid. And so uh, how do we do that? The first and the main reason, the main process is revocable living trust centered estate planning. Uh, living trust is a will substitute, talks about who gets what when I die, who's in charge, but because it owns property, we do not have to get court orders to transfer. Um, and we do not have to go through creditors period. We do not have to publish in a newspaper. There are many things that get avoided. We do not have a living trust. Anyone watching this seminar, either live or later, we're going to give a 10% discount um, if you have a current living trust you want us to look at, we don't charge to do that, to take a look and just see if anything needs to be updated. Typically, most of them are, are good. Um, some of them were done incorrectly or your life has changed, but that's the main reason, the main process. Uh, many of many people are calling right now thinking about getting that done and we're happy to help you check that off the list. Um, the, the transfer on death deed um, is something that uh, we, we're, we're you know, getting up to the hour here. I don't want to go too long, but something essentially where you can name a beneficiary directly on a deed. Um, we're not a big fan of it um, because we believe that the law is going to lapse. They, it's automatically set to lapse. And we've seen a lot when, of- when is, it set, when is it set to lapse, Jason? You know, I don't have, I don't have the date off, off the top of my head, but I want to say it was uh, I, 21 or something. Like yeah, that. I think it, it, the, the current law expires next year, but there is um, uh, an amendment uh, currently um, on the table to extend it, I think, to 2024. Yeah, so you think, uh, I, Tom, I don't, it's, it's, I don't it, see this going away, honestly. And I think the, I think this COVID situation with the cl closing down of the courts, um, I, I think we're going to see this transfer on debt to become more and more popular, believe it or not. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, because is that a good thing or a bad thing, Tom? What are the positives and negatives as it relates to this uh, revocable transfer on death deed? Because that's kind of a hot button item right now. And it just came on the scene about what, two, maybe three Six, years 2016. ago? 2016. 2016 as it came out on the scene. Well, I can tell you that we are getting close to the hour. And this is probably an, an, uh, uh, another day to go into really in depth 
on um, the revocable transfer on death deed, but I can tell you that it, it, this, the use of it, although it's been around since 2016, the use of it is, is fairly new. Um, we haven't seen a lot of transactions closed in reliance on the revocable, revocable transfers on death deed. Um, and so the title industry as a whole really doesn't know kind of where the claims are gonna be coming from and what the impact of those claims, um, how frequent those, you know, the, the claims are gonna come in. So we don't have, um, our, our guidelines for underwriting these files are based on, are, are based on a, um, um, you know, a, a, a history that doesn't exist, a claim history. So right, most right. of most of the industry, the industry has taken a pretty conservative approach on on uh, the, getting to a point to rely on the revocable transfer on death deed. You know, when I talk to people about it, I always start off saying that, you know, the 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 legal and the lawyer um, uh, lobbyist is pretty strong, not just in California, but pretty much everywhere. Uh, and we didn't hear one attorney screaming up and down about passing this law because I don't think it's taking business away from them. I think it's uh, in some instances may create more, more traffic to their door. Um, but it's there, it's, it's, a, it's statutorily created and um, it can be used, but um, it's uh, until we get a feel for where the claims are going to be coming from, it's really difficult to, to uh, uh, underwrite these. So we're pretty strict on our underwriting right now. Not just me. I say, when I say we are, I'm, I'm talking about the industry as a whole, because I do talk to my counterparts at the other, uh, at the other underwriters. Um, you know, if the claims start coming in, we may lighten up or tighten up our underwriting guidelines. It's, it's, it's too early to tell. So, um, but if anybody wants to know more about it and the ins and outs, I'm more than willing to come out to the office when we can or do another, uh, 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 uh type of uh, pr presentation such as this on Zoom to go over the revocable transfer on death deed. So, and I can tell you that we at Tycor we've closed probably a couple dozen transactions in reliance on a revocable transfer on death deed. So we're not afraid of them, but we do, um, we do tiptoe through the tulips very carefully. Hey, another quick question on that though. It's not just a clear and, and, and straight form document. There's additional documentation above and beyond a traditional transaction when it comes to the revocable transfer on death deed, right? That, that's correct. And, and I think that's probably uh, when we should get more in detail on the, on, in discussing those additional documents that the title company would require uh, to close. Um, you know, one of the things I always t say about the revocable transfer on death deed is a, a young, healthy, um, uh, man like uh, like Ryan probably would not record a revocable transfer on death deed on his property. You know, probably an old guy like me who, you know, is coming to, you know, I, I see that light at the end of the tunnel, um, it would more than likely be signing it. So, you, so the first question, so, so, <laughs> so the first question is, is it's typically going to be signed in contemplation of death. So your first question is, is the capacity of the person signing the document. So, um, and if we can't get past that, then we really can't rely on that document. But, um, but yeah, there are a host of questions that are asked and there are a host of documents, um, declarations, affidavits that I would draft depending on the fact pattern. Um, and, uh, and, um, uh, well, the reason Tom, I bring it up is because a lot of times when we're working with our folks, um, they don't understand that there's going to be additional documentation. So I guess the idea would be if you're coming up to a transaction, you know, that somebody's passed away, that the property is held with a revocable transfer on death deed. You'll want to get involved and do your searching sooner than later, uh, and know that there's going to be some additional underwriting things take, that are going to be needed in order to clear this property yes. and, and issue a new title insurance policy on it for the new owner. Yeah, and that deed is subject to the California Department of Health Services, so you will have to get a clearance from them as well. So, and that can take some time, especially if uh, if we're still under a quarantine and uh, you know half half of the governmental uh, departments are on half staff or most of them are on half staff. So that can, um, you know, impact turn times. But yes, I always recommend, I just had one in LA County where they were talking to me about the, there was a revocable transfer on death deed recorded. The grantor has not passed away. They're trying to sell the property, but what if? And I told them, well, let's get a prelim on it right away. Let's, let's get that ball rolling because you, you don't want to wait because it can take some time to get all that information um, together. So let, me, let me try and wrap some of this up then, I guess, with some key points that I took from it. Uh, number one, Jason said that uh, the time to get uh, them involved is early. You have a friend, a family member, someone in your farm area that's calling you 
Um, Jason, do you charge for them to do an initial consultation? Or even let's say, for example, it's somebody here on this call uh, and they have questions. They're not even there yet, but they need to present your information. Is that something that you do? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we are constantly evaluating cases for free at the beginning. Um, I, I just have a rule about charging folks before we know if it's even a case. So a lot of times we're I'm talking to Victoria, uh, we're pulling deeds, we're talking to Tom, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing what does title say before we start and helping folks, either it's the agent calling us or the family calling us, trying to give them all the information they could possibly need to get started. Okay. Uh, you referenced, obviously, there was a discount on it uh, for anybody that's on this call. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for offering it out for our clients as well. That's a big deal. Uh, something else I heard Tom mention earlier was that loyalty does have its privileges, that uh, be it in all fields of business, that when you work with someone consistently and you start creating a pattern uh, as to how you operate and that your, your word is your bond and things of that nature, that that can have benefits and allow things to move a bit more smoothly. Uh, one of the things that Jason kind of touched on, but relatively briefly on it, was in regards to the fact that everyone getting along. So if you are talking with your clients, uh, you know, and Jason said this in previous events, he says, uh, listen, the only one that wins uh, if the family decides not to get along through this process is the attorneys and uh, the, uh, the courts and the, the state. So they're the ones that are going to keep soaking money out of the family's estate. It's, it's best to try and figure out how to get them to agree uh, or at least agree through the scenario. Is that uh, relatively accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry. I'm not trying to, to take money out of your pocket in regards to, you know, you know I, I mean, if you really want to make Jason a wealthy man, then, then tell your people to not get along and uh, take oh, a drag yeah. about it on look, the bike. But I don't look, think that's what along, Jason wants. Yeah, look, you know, a lot of people, I talked to a guy yesterday for about 30 minutes and, and he's thinking about, switching lawyers, which he, he has a good lawyer. I think they're just not seeing eye to eye. So I encourage them to stay where he is, which, you know, I don't, I don't like people to jump ship if they can make it work where they are. But the, they say, I can never get along with my sister. You don't know anyone like her. And I said, you know, 17 years of doing this, I've met your sister 800 times. And <laughs> the best thing you can do is to get along with her because the only people that win are people like me. If you're fighting, that's it. I win when you fight. And there's a lot of lawyers that would never try to stop you from fighting because you don't know any better. And you'll spend, this guy had spent $30,000 in legal fees and the issue he was fighting over, in my opinion, he should never, never have started fighting over in the first place legally or morally. The mom had given his sister some money before she died and he wanted her to pay it back. I said, it was a gift. There's nothing you can do and your lawyer should have told you that. So I say all that to go, absolutely. If you can get along at the beginning, it's going to save everyone time mm -hmm. and money. You know, you may be holding your your tongue to get along, but it's better that way. And if you have a spouse that is very, you know, over excited about defending you, ask them to please stay out of it. Uh, a lot of times it's hard for us as spouses to see our, our, our significant other getting abused and not want to step in. And sometimes you'll say something that will derail the whole thing. So I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. try, try to get them to get along as much as they can. Right. So there's a bunch of people on the call and all their mics are pretty much muted right now uh, while I'm kind of talking. If you have a question that you'd like to ask directly and you're not afraid to share your voice with us, please go ahead and unmute your mic and uh, we'll give you a second to jump in and, and ask, ask a question uh, verbally here. Uh, I know that Dean in the chat box said that the, uh, the deputies make some money doing evictions and all kinds of stuff as well. Um, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's a whole bunch of other people, but like I can tell you is who does lose out when, when people fight is the family uh, of, the, of the deceased. So uh, it definitely doesn't make any sense to, to sit there and fight and quarrel about those items. It's kind of, I guess, if we think about evictions in general, or if you have a tenant, it's better to give them some money and have them get out peacefully than it is to have to take them to court. Uh, it costs you probably as much or more, and they might damage the place along the way. So. If that wasn't true before, it's very true now. Yep. Because the court is now, the courts are complete. They're setting hearings for some of our things in December of this year, December. So, so. But now you're also saying that as well, uh, but I guess it wouldn't really matter, would it? Because what I was going to say is uh, that they can close the transaction, the real estate transaction, before the probate is finalized. Uh, but typically that's with approval of the court, right? Right. Yeah. But, but still that the beginning part, the first hearings are being still being set, not that far out. Some of the, some of the final accounting hearings are being set 
very far out. Or if somebody's fighting, it's like the courts are saying, okay, you want to fight? We'll see you next June. Um, you know, yeah. and that's, so, so the, hey, we're here and we all get along hearings are, are going to be, and we're being told they're going to be fast forwarded a bit. Typically those are set sooner than the, hey, the whole case is over. We need to be, need to be heard. So, um, so I guess that's a quandary though. And here's a big question. Let's say, for example, the family's trying to take over this house. There's still a mortgage that needs to be paid. There's no renters in it. And the family doesn't have any money to make the payments. Do they just default on it then at that point? Is the yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's, yeah, they default. Essentially the mortgage is in, in the, the name of the decedent. So we're not worried about their credit anymore. And, and because of the sort of the pausing of foreclosures, most companies we're finding are, are understanding we can't make it back to court. So you know, you're going to have to wait and you can't make it back to court either to foreclose mm -hmm. on it. So everybody relax. Right. And they are. So like communication is everything. We can communicate with, with the family and with the people involved. It's everything. Got it. All right, Miss Rhonda, you don't have any questions here or Steve Mathis or uh, Dean Madison, no one, Wanda, no one's got any questions that they want to jump through and, uh, and ask. I don't see any mutes, uh, mics unmuting here. Um, all right, well, we are at uh, 1245, so we're about an hour and 15 minutes. Like I said, we want to hold true to our time schedules. I know you guys have been kind of zoomed out. There's been a lot of stuff going on. Uh, next week when we get on our calls, we're going to be doing a, a class with uh, real estate attorney and litigator Stephen Cho out of Rancho Cucamonga um, with CKB Vienna, talking about uh, real estate and legal updates and what things we're battling through now. Uh, I did also reach out to you before today's call because somebody had asked this question and I was unaware. Um, so we were trying to get somebody on, but I'll have the documentation on the post of this recording. Um, so just check your lookout for it. When I do get it, if you're interested, I will send it to you, which has to do with your board of realtors and the additional documentation that's required for you guys in uh, probate transactions. So uh, again, we're just doing everything we can to fight through uh, this time to find a way to still be a resource, provide valuable information and how we connect the dots. Because uh, as Victoria is on here, she could probably shake her head and agree. Uh, if we know you, we can grow you and communication is absolutely key. So a huge shout out to Mr. Tom Bernath and uh, Jason Gowdy here today for coming out and giving of themselves and their time. No and uh, Mr. Tom Bernath is out of our Riverside office. It's tom.bernath at tycortitle.com. Uh, Jason is jason at gaudylaw.com or gaudylaw.com is the website. And that's G-A-U-D-Y, kind of like it's spelled on his picture there. So uh, Andy just put it in the notes. So you got it in several different locations. We referenced uh, uh, Paul Wilkins as well with the approved inheritance cash. Uh, which again, that's where they're able to front some of the monies in order to help the family get through the process. So a tremendous team of people here uh, that's here to support you every step of the way. And you can always reach out and we will share it with you. Uh, last, any last minute things there, guys? Nothing at all. I, I know people in these seminars, it's, it's hard to bring your question out. Sometimes it has to do with your family. Please feel